Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everybody, and welcome our esteemed panel today. Um, my name is Emma Dexter. I'm Director of Visual Arts at the British Council, and I'm the Commissioner of the British Pavilion, um, where we are today. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you today to Terme's Wellbeing Culture Forum on the Impact of Social Practice. Our partnership with Terma has now been going for four years, and I'm profoundly grateful to Mikolai, Robert, Shelby, and all the team at Terma for their outstanding generosity and leadership philanthropy throughout, which continues to make a really valuable contribution to helping us deliver our British Council vision of a more connected world through culture. And this year, in particular, assisting us with making Sonia's exhibition so spectacular upstairs and such a great success. We at the British Council are dedicated to bringing people together to share culture and grow in our thinking about the world and in our thinking about each other. Mikolai started Terma Group's cultural component, Terma Art, believing that through the ideas and creativity of artists, cities and urban developments can be reshaped to meet the physical and spiritual needs of human beings, allowing them to reconnect with their inner selves. So this synergy between our two organizations is immediate and obvious, and so we're really proud to continue our partnership with Terma again this year. So I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event and also um, the British Pavilion. And now I would like to in hand over to Mikolai Sakutovic, CEO and curator of Terma Art. So uh, thank you so much, Emma Dexter. I mean, the collaboration with uh, the British Council and with you personally, and also with Louisa McKinney and with the whole team uh, of the British Council is for us an uh, absolute highlight of our cultural program. Um, we are endlessly thankful, and it's very interesting because people um, are very often thanking us for supporting art, but actually uh, it's a deal. It's a deal where we are getting much more than we give. And this is like, I'm 100% convinced that this is not only true, but we are also seeing the fruits of this. So when, um, you know, the, the possibility to dive into spaces of possibilities that are created like uh, for Sonia Boys, for example, here, it is uh, opening up a completely new perspective to reassess what we already know or what we should have known uh, better, like for example in this exhibition, and then to see it in a different light. Uh, one of the biggest problems of our economic, social um, and um, environmental uh, situation right now is that we don't have enough fantasy. So we are basically repeating the mistakes that were made since many, many hundreds of years and uh, and this repetition of mistakes uh, is something, uh, is basically a dead end street. We are not able really to, uh, to, to develop anything um, in the boxes, in the silos of, of, of our social, um, uh, economical and environmental solutions. So right now, um, being in a pavilion like, like this one, um, um, this British pavilion um, uh, designed by Sonia Boys with uh, with bringing us back into uh, understanding a special moment in time um, in the way how it really was, how it really influenced and how it should be also understood, uh, gives hope. It's very simple. Your exhibition is giving hope uh, for, for many people. And uh, when we went with Tiny through it, it was interesting because he, for example, understood it immediately because he has this kind of background. And another precious of Koyomon, uh, your uh, exhibition today uh, that we visited with the Minister of Culture of UAE uh, in the Arsenale gives also hope because it is also showing that actually, you know, artists, uh, they don't always have to deal only with death matter, transforming something that is not alive anymore into a sculpture, into a painting or into something that will become part of an, you know, apartment of a rich person. It is actually uh, dealing with life, what makes art really beautiful, and this is what you are both doing, and this is why it's so amazing that we are both here on this panel to tell about this. So your gardens, for example, 
make it, you know, it's hard for an artist to, to work with something that has an own subject, that is not an object, that has an own identity, and this identity to bring it forward because it is an identity against an identity. So you, you basically create a platform um, for somebody else. And uh, this is dealing with life, much more complex, but something that is really, really urgent and necessary to implement in a broad scale in our society. So I'm so happy that we get this, you know, innovation, this impulse, this uh, yeah, creative uh, uh, um, um, impulse uh, for us also to think through. We learn every day and um, I'm so happy to announce now this panel. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm basically announcing Hans-Ulrich Oberst as the co-curator of our Wellbeing Culture Forum and without him we definitely wouldn't be here. So Hans-Ulrich, thank you so much for all your support and a big round of applause for Hans-Ulrich. <laughs> And then I would um, also introduce Muni Lola. Uh, she is an artist and curator at our program. And um, I would uh, thank you also for this incredible preparation of all our forums. And a big round of applause for Muni Lola also, please. Um, and if I can hand you the microphone to introduce the panelists properly, then I would be extremely thankful. And I want to thank again Thank you very, very much for everything what we can learn here and uh, what we can participate in. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Nikolai. And thank you everyone who is joining us today for this conversation on the impact of social practice. I'm so excited to be in your company and to dive in. Um, I think we should start with Sonia. Uh, and just a, a bit of a bi biography about her. Sonia Boyce, O-B-E-R-A, was born in London, UK in 1962, where she continues to live and work. In 2019, the artist received an OBE for services to the art in the Queen's New Year honors list, as well as the honorary doctorate from the Royal College of Art. In 2016, Boyce was elected as the Royal Academ Academician and received a Paul Hamlin Artist Award. Between 2012 to 2017, Boyce was professor of fine art at Middlesex University, and since 2014, she has been professor at the University of Arts in London. And we are so happy to also have your installation feeling her way at this year's Venice Biennale. And um, I can say that it was such a joy to be able to experience your installation and to see all of these musicians come together. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And I can maybe pass it on to Hans to introduce Precious. Yeah, thank you so much, Mikolai. Uh, thank you so much, Ronilona. And we are really delighted to be here with Sonia, with Precious, with Emma. And before we start, I think uh, we really have to celebrate the amazing pavilion here by Sonia, curated by Emma, and the amazing installation of Precious. So please give them a very big round of applause. <laughs> And we have um, different questions, Sonia. Uh, for you, you're going to join the first part of this panel. We are so grateful because we know that you've got to go into other interviews. So we'll begin with, uh, with you. And um, of course, you have spoken and given so many amazing interviews about this uh, pavilion, uh, which, we, you know, which we read. So we wanted to actually uh, ask you um, uh, more general topics today. But I thought one thing would be interesting to begin with. I read the catalog last night. And for those of you who actually haven't read it, um, here is the book, Feeding Her Way, Sonia Boyce. It's a very urgent book. You should all read it. And uh, in this book, I was um, amazed to see that, uh, and it's actually Emma who mentioned it, that George Lemming is uh, relevant for, for your work. And um, as you know, I've worked a lot on Edouard Glissant and um, the importance of Edouard Glissant as a, as a toolbox for, for the 21st century. Um, and uh, also have recently interviewed Sylvia Winter. And actually in the context of this interview with Sylvia Winter, we came across George Lemming a couple of times, and um, whom I've never met, who is in his 90s now. Uh, and uh, I thought it would be fascinating to hear from you um, more about <laughs> this is a beautiful book, really beautiful book, by Hans Ulrich about, well, conversations, isn't it? 
Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of curious to start this talk with uh, trying to think about someone like George Lamming. For people who don't know, George Lamming was a Barbadian um, writer, um, a great thinker, actually, and there's a, a classic book of his called In the Castle of My Skin, which uh, is a novel about a young, young man growing up in, in, in British colonial Barbados, um, and starting to understand the context of the kind of cloning experience within the Caribbean and his own place within it, and starting then to question um, uh, the kind of colonial project, you might say. So this, in a way, it may seem a, a rather odd beginning for this conversation about, um, about social practice, but... Uh, one of the things that I have been thinking of, and actually was in a, I had a show which I titled In the Castle of My Skin, was to, was to question or was to, to pose uh, a, a set of um, ways in which artists um, occupy uh, an understanding about, about their body internally and externally, emotionally and conceptually. Um, it was a group show, actually. Well, I say it was a group show. It was a group show under my name, but I was bringing other artists into uh, this artwork, um, so it was really difficult to distinguish one artist's work from another. But what I really wanted to, um, I suppose, uh, pose was two things, and I think part of this, part of this comes into um, some of the questions that are going to emerge. Um, the idea of the singular authorship and what context are artists working in, but also how do we relate to each other? A lot of artists are making works that are about what is our relationship to, to other humans, but also what is our relationship to the wider political and ecological context that we're in. So for me, um, in the castle of my skin, not only as using that title um, as uh, as the basis for a, a work, but that novel and George Lamming posing that question about context and, and slowly beginning to understand the context that you're in, um, for me is incredibly pertinent for our time. Yeah, I think when I when I had the chance to see your installation, the thing that struck me the most was the playfulness. You know, like seeing the musicians come together, there was a lot of laughter, a lot of joy. Um, and I think that oftentimes in political discourse, we don't really talk about play too often, or we see it as distraction or juvenile fun. But I think that play can actually be a way to relocate our humanity and our connection to ourselves and to our bodies. So I'm just curious to, to, to know more about how you kind of thought about play in the process of making this installation and what you think it can teach us about how to relate to other people, to ourselves, to the environment. I mean, that's it. Within, you know, within this discussion about play, and it's true, we do tend to think of play as an infantile thing, and I think that for adults we find it incredibly difficult to, to play. It's almost as if we have, a, uh, we have a, an anxiety about revealing ourselves, our so-called true selves, in, in that moment of play. So often play... Um, as an adult, is something that happens in the realm of the sexual, but not in the realm of exploring what it is, what is our possibility together. And, you know, for me, um, I'm, 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 even though I do feel the anxiety when I'm working with a, a group of people who won't know each other, um, in a space where um, I'm asking them to just see what can happen, to improvise without a script, to find a way to negotiate with each other. I know that I'm asking them, and I'm also on that journey, of the space between the known and the unknown. And that's what play is about, because play is about trying to get, particularly playing with others, is about trying to get to a, a place of innovation. What is the edge of this? What is the edge of our possibilities between, between me and you? And then, and of course, within that, when one is able to overcome that moment of anxiety and um, that sense of vulnerability and go on that journey, extraordinary things can happen. But I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that it's un, um, that it's an easy thing to do. Um, I do think that anxiety is there for a real, for an important reason. But 
on the other side of that anxiety, there are so many possibilities. And I do think that as adults, we do find it very difficult to, to create spaces for play in the way that children might. I think that for, for me, play is kind of like the giddiness of surrender. Like once you allow, you know, yourself to just let go and there's like a, like a, there's a whimsicalness to it that I think it, we're afraid to kind of unlock in ourselves at time. But I, yeah. I, I mean, a part of me wonders whether it's, and I mean, if other people got ideas here, do throw them in. I do think that it's, um, as one gets older, the, the, the idea of a certainty of one's identity gets challenged when you go into, into the environment of play, which children may not necessarily feel they have to guard as much. Um, so yeah, I do think that there, there's, there, there is a joy element, but there is you know, the possibility, the loss of identity when you play with others that I think it, you know, creates huge anxiety for adults because we have, we have to hold on to certain senses of ourselves in, in the adult world. That's why I think it's so beautiful that your practice centers improvisation because to me, improvisation is also a way of playing, a way of being ultra present in your body and kind of having a soft focus of the room and of all of the different energies that are swirling through the space. And I think in the world that we're living in today that thrives off of decapitate, like a desensitization and uh, living in projections and living in fear, to live presently in the body and to allow yourself to yeah, to, improv to impro improvise with other people, I think is a really powerful political gesture. Um, yeah. Can I just add to that, just in terms of this question of improvisation, yeah. sorry, that's loud, um, in that, you know, I, I, I think I haven't, I haven't done enough research, but my feeling is the reason why um, improvisation was so central to jazz is that it's about, um, feeling precarious and thinking on one's feet. And so I do think that the historical reason why jazz came about out of the context of you know, that, that traumatic transatlantic journey and having to always always be thinking, oh, how do I get out of this? Having, always, having to have, always having to have a, a kind of immediate strategy, I think is part and parcel of what formed jazz music. And jazz music, of course, announced the modern age. I think that's a, a brilliant reading and it makes a lot of sense. I think that we, we talk about presence a lot and I, I'm always kind of wanting to parse out the political kind of force behind that. And I think this is like a, a great historical connection to it. Um, I mean, in speaking of how you work with other people, I know that you, know, you bring a, a group of people together, things happen. What, what is the process of kind of, I don't want to say extracting, but like pulling the, the visual material, the, the sonic material, the, the written material, like how do you go about that process of turning it into, as an example, feeling her way at this you know, beautiful, comprehensive multimedia installation? Um, and maybe I will have yeah. this conversation a little bit with Emma. Emma uh, Ridgway, as, as has been said, has curated this project uh, alongside me. And, um, you know, there are, there, are two, there are two phases, you could say, in my process. One is uh, that I will invite a group of people into a particular space. I, um, I say, well, we're going to improvise, and people often say, with what, about what, what is it that you want? And I say, well, actually, it's a space in which um, I will not direct, I do work with a uh, filmmaker, uh, Michelle Tofi, who often brings in a crew who's going to document whatever happens. There's a stills photographer who documents, so there's lots of documentation happening while things are unfolding, but I, I never look through. Uh, I'm not looking through the lens. I'm not... My aim is to be in the space with, the, with, the, with whatever's taking place. Um, and... That is a moment where I'm, um, particularly with the performers here, and we had a we had a short kind of Zoom. They only actually met like half an hour before this film, the first film, four films started. They'd never met before. They'd only met on Zoom, and they were very anxious. Um, but yeah, that so they they are coming into a space where they don't know each other. I mean, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah. So. 
we intensely worked together for the first month. We spent, it was lockdown, so we spent a huge amount of time on Zoom. Yeah, and various family members pointed out five-hour stints weren't normal. But um, that's the type of conversations that happen when you're doing commissioning. You've got to get to really I don't know, trust where it goes and it flows, which is why Sonia titled the exhibition Feeling Her Way. Um, and some of the framing and distilling and working out we needed to do from Sonia's seed of an idea of bringing together female black singers to My ask them fantasy to female band. <laughs> the fantasy band. You can imagine it could have been a pretty broad remit, right? So there was a long list. So we needed to work out the short list, the shape, what we were inviting people into as an experience that they could play in by saying enough that they understood the context, but not directing or being too specific, because that's not Sonia's style. That is what people from the performing arts are used to, but visual arts can be a bit more freeform. So it was also reassuring, being reassuring about this context too, and that explaining that the visual arts and contemporary audiences, when they're coming into something, there is a generosity and an openness with which people come to things. You don't know what you're going to go and see. You don't know where you're going to be at with it. It's very different from an audience body that's one body together that will clap at a certain time where all the music, all the everything has to be performed, rehearsed. Very, very, very different audience relationships in exhibitions and music. And that was... So there's a few things to work through to reassure the articulation and to go back to the play point... One of the things that was really important in it too, and in, in play generally, whether it's uh, jazz, improv, the beginnings of that, or Dada and the beginnings of the avant-garde playground with that, is that in some of the play theories they explain it has to be voluntary, whether it's with children or with adults, it has to be voluntary, and it has to be based in trust. And that was one of the key things that people said on the day of the Abbey Road Studios Day. People trusted Sonia. They knew her work, or if they didn't, it's pretty easy to find out a lot and find it out fast. And so there's very few conversations we had because we set the frame carefully. And just to add one more point and then back over very much to hear from Sonia while she's here. Sonia not directing is part of her exploration of freedom, really, and the complexity of freedom. And actually, it's quite difficult if people aren't directed. You're invited, for example, what sounds free in your voice to do something that's very freeing. But that's actually quite difficult to do because when you're in a situation where people are not given roles and given certainty, you then have to navigate and negotiate that. And that's a big aspect of Sonia's work that's undeclared, really, within inviting people to come together that there's an uneasiness when everybody's coming in, being told they can be free, and then have to navigate without direction how they interact. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And, um, and actually <coughs> makes me think of a conversation I had many years ago when we installed Utopia Station here um, with Christoph Schlingensief, the late German you know, uh, playwright and... Um, filmmaker and, uh, and artist, and, and Christoph talked about this. We talked about Hannah Hoech one day here in Venice in Starling, and then we talked about the idea of a social collage, and that idea that things kind of emerge, this emergence no, in, a, in a social collage, which is also beautifully described in, in your catalog, the idea that you kind of intuitively juxtapose material from life and then discover <laughs> what, what emerges, I think is, is incredible about this pavilion. I know that Sonia has to go soon, and we had <coughs> actually... One, we had so many more questions, but we had two questions which go, which go into the future, because we think it's, it's, it's interesting uh, that now that we can celebrate uh, this amazing pavilion that we can also think about, um, about the future. And one thing I was very curious is <clears throat> about your unrealized projects, because we know a lot about architects' unrealized projects, but it's very strange that we know so little about artists' unrealized projects. And now that this incredible work is realized, I was, of course, curious what are your still unrealized projects? And that can be many things, because there can be projects which are too big to be realized. Sometimes it's also time, ta projects which are too time intense. I mean, the, the, um, actually a composer once told me that Ligeti, that he had another, he was in his 70s, he had another 
100 years of music to write. So there were a lot of compositions which were unrealized because of time. Um, then uh, there can also be projects which are simply utopic, maybe unrealizable dreams. Then there is censorship, can be a reason for projects be, uh, being unrealized. And then the late Doris Dor Dor Lessing in London always talked about, uh, when I asked her this question, she always said, like, there are also projects we might not have dared to do. She called that self-censorship. So these are just, and there are many more reasons. No? But, uh, so within this whole range, it would be fantastic at this moment where this is actually realized to hear about one or two of your favorite still unrealized projects. Well, um, most definitely my, the, the, the longest running unrealized project is to build um, the devotional museum to actually build a museum as an artwork for the devotional collection. Now, of course, part of the reason that it's not yet realized is the time and the money to do such a thing, but that is my fantasy. Uh, and actually, one of, the, one of the works that is inspiring this idea is a work by Orhan Pamuk called uh, The Museum of Incense, which is based on a, a, a love novel that he wrote and then created, uh, the work is in Istanbul and has created um, a museum that accompanies the novel that he's written. So I'm really, I'm really interested in this idea that you, you can take one form and make it into another. But to, uh, actually there's an artist, who, a friend who I have seen well, running around the Biennale, um, 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 Orlan, oh, so my, my name, names are going um, to disappear at the moment. But um, when I when I when I mentioned this to him, he said, "So um, maybe you need to um, you need to go on a bricklaying course." And I think actually he's right. I need to know literally how to build a wall, and then how to build a wall into a space, and how to build a space, and what to then do with that space in relation to the collection. So I, I, at some point, I will do a bricklaying course. Um, because I think, how, how will I understand how to build a museum without having, knowing how to build a space? Thanks for this great answer. And I actually went to this museum of Arham Pamuk with him. And it's, of course, very fascinating because he wrote the book first. So it's kind of the book produced reality in a way. So we can think of an exhibition or a book actually produce this museum. And then thinking about the future, I see also um, several young artists here. And I think it's interesting. Uh, the Rainer Maria Rilke book is always with me, you know, the advice to a young poet. And I was wondering what today would be your, your advice to, to a young artist. Um, so my advice would be talk to each other, to invite other artists into your studio, um, record those conversations with their permission, of course. Um, but really, really, you, those conversations propel the work forward. I mean, I'm into conversations anyway and interviewing and talking and talking as a thing that may seem immaterial that generates something material. But I do think to talk with other artists so that, you know, because there's a strange thing that can happen in the studio when the curator comes or someone who is interested in the work, but the, the work is, put, you know, imagine to go somewhere else but when an artist talks to another artist in the studio it's about being located in that space not with the possibility of a show somewhere so I think those kinds of conversations are incredibly important because it's about thinking uh, you're thinking through what what you're experiencing with the work thank you so much big round of applause for Sonia thank you so much <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so, I'm sorry it's so short. Thanks so much. It was wonderful. I also wanted to say, uh, for those of you who are going to travel or be in London at some point, uh, we have at the Serpentine an amazing new film at the moment in the context of uh, Radio Ballads. And Bettina Korak and I and our teams are so happy and thankful, Sonia, to you for this amazing piece. And also, actually, I see all the curators here of this exhibition, Amal Kala, Elizabeth Graham, Leila Gaitan, Zatalek Grabowska. So when you're in London, please come and visit us at the Serpentine and visit Sonia's amazing piece. Sonia, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, maybe just briefly, because the devo devotional series was mentioned, but if you could maybe elaborate a bit on the devotional series and how it kind of paved the way for feeling her way. Yeah, so Sonia would obviously describe it best, were she able to stay. 
the devotional collection is an ongoing, it's like an ongoing living archive that Sonia has. And it started very beautifully and in a very Sonia way, which was as a project in 1999 at FACT in Liverpool, as a community-based project with the Liverpool Black Sisters. And Sonia's got a very inquiry-based way of doing her work, and she was interested in thinking about black British female singers. And so she posed to the group, let's think of some names of black British female singers. And then they had a really long, quite embarrassing pause as they, you know, what came to mind was American singers. And part of the question driving Sonia's inquiry into that is her own, of course, lived experience of how people expect a British person to sound and what ex accent people expect people to have. So she turned it into something very much of an artistic inquiry. And they then record Shirley Bassey and then, of course, did a big rendition spontaneously of Hey Big Spender because it's very difficult to say these names without these things. And in fact, in the summer when doing this project, um, she had Goldfinger. She oh, popped around to the studio and she said, I can't get Goldfinger it's out of my mind. It's just like running through. <laughs> because she had all these items upstairs, including samples of wallpaper that she'd be working on with her studio producer, Neve. And um, so the project kept growing because then people went home and chatted to friends and family about that. And so then names kept coming. And then she thought the project, which was called Motherload, which, of course, I looked up what that was because I'm a geek, and it's the seam to when you find real gold. And the, but the project kept going on even though she thought it had finished. And people, when she'd be at talks, people would bring a carrier bag with records, with items. Or, and so the project became this kind of collective knowledge project that other people sustained an interest in, which is a kind of very interesting way. And Sonia has a very conversational mode of practice. And then since that, she's had a number of different projects that she's drawn from that collection. And it's in that way that this sprang, essentially. So she dips into this ongoing project, as is of interest. And that's why there's a selection of some of the items just in the last six months, but just some... That's what's in the gallery that's right above us right now. Yeah, that gives us a hint of how this museum, which hopefully will be realized, will, will be. Now, one thing I was curious is, you know, thinking about Sonia's practice and the idea, actually, uh, that very often the practice also happens, of course, outside an exhibition space, happens, you know, within communities. I was kind of wondering, uh, in terms of you curating the pavilion and you and Sonia collaborating, how, sort of, you know, what happens elsewhere. We are here in the pavilion, we see the exhibition, to which extent um, you connect or you had intentions or plans or maybe over the duration of the pavilion to connect it to Venice and to connect it to communities here or to maybe also bring it to other cities and connect it to communities there. In a way, um, I mean it was interesting yesterday to hear um, what Maria Eichhorn, for example, working with all these anti-fascist organizations, you know, in Venice, these groupings, no, for the pavilion in relation to the German pavilion. So I was very curious, you know, as, as Mikolai wanted, uh, in a way, this panel to be about um, uh, curation as a form of social practice. It's interesting, I think, you know, how to bring such an exhibition into society. And the title maybe gives away what might happen. So each iterative step develops something else. So it would be a case of seeing what emerges. And also the people who are invigilating upstairs are the fellows for the project. So the British Council have a number of different fellows from who are artists, you know, architects, various different disciplines and who joined the projects because they're interested in Sonia's work. They had kind of vague hints as to what it might be. And then they will do some collaborative projects themselves and some research projects in the time they're here. So different things will emerge from that. So sort of things springboard, don't they? Ideas kind of springboard and spark out of different projects. So we don't have set plans as to what it would be next. The exhibition will then next year go to Turner Contemporary and Margate, who have a very active participatory program. And then it will go to the Yale Centre for British Art in the States. So it will grow and things will happen. 
So it's actually the opposite of a master plan. It will evolve, it will grow. It's, yeah. it's a reality plan. Exactly, a reality plan. It's beautiful, I love that. Now, one more question is, in a way, you know, it's been an incredibly intense process, uh, as you said, over, over these lockdowns and you working with Sonia so intensely on this show. What was the most surprising moment in this whole process? Because, you know, we're here in Venice, and of course, Venice is also the, the city where Yagilev um, is, is, is buried, and uh, he founded, um, of course, the ballet where, you know, he brought together so many different disciplines, and um, you know, he and Cocteau kind, kind of this thing about Etonema, no? The idea surprised me. It's always interesting, I think, in the process of when you work on an exhibition, what is a surprising moment? Mm. Um, there was many twists and turns, as for anyone commissioning at the moment because of the pandemic, and then the B word, in terms of like trying to make things happen uh, with Brexit. So there's lots of different twists and turns the project took. And I think one of the things that was surprising was, for me, was the whole way through the project and the whole way through any of these projects, but particularly when working with Sonia Boyce, you're striving to really drop your expectations so that you remain open, remain open. You don't know which way things are going to go. And my role right from the beginning was to try and articulate and visualize what the exhibition might be from the idea and where it was and articulate that because we needed to communicate it to others and keep doing that throughout. So the book, which sometimes sounds like I'm describing, visiting this and describing it, is actually speculatively imagining what the exhibition might be like and then trying to interpret what that is. That's actually the nature of the accounts of the exhibition in the book. And also some of the behind the scenes, because on the day of filming in Abbey Road Studios, and the reason for that choice of venue was because the emotionality in the women's voices is so key to Sonia capturing the voices the best possible way we could in order that that gets conveyed here because it's necessarily going to, you're going to lose a lot when you record, you're going to lose a lot when you edit a video, you're going to lose a lot and all those nuances we wanted to keep. And we had some structure for the day. The start was a warm up. They're just meeting for the first time. They're coming together for the first time. The second section was um, their free form improvisation. And then the third section was they each got a few minutes to do whatever they wanted of their solos. That's the pieces you see in the side galleries. And I just made the assumption, and I think some others did too, that the agreement was everything that was filmed, Sonia could do whatever she wanted with after. Nobody had any say in the edits. She'd worked closely with her collaborator, Michelle Tofi. And my, the thing that surprised me most was that she used aspects from the warm-up and there was conversations where kind of, you know, we'd all reflected and chatted afterwards. Erilyn Wallen is complete genius and completely incredible. And she listens and then imagines and changes their voices with things she asks them to evoke. A bell, a lion, these things. Um, and I just assumed that she would kind of use more of when they were just free form and completely tuned in with each other and really playing like with their voices together. And it's one of those moments where I was so surprised by it. You know, when you get a real surprise, you think, hang on, so what was I expecting? And what assumption was I making? And it was a useful, revealing moment about Sonia's practice that it is about that creative process. So that they freeformed into a very exquisite thing that would have been amazing here and that would have, you know, the sound all pirouetted together. And that wasn't what she's actually looking for. That's not actually her style. She's looking for something more difficult, something more uncomfortable, where the intimate social relations are actually slightly uneasy. They've only just met. And so that was a really useful surprise. Yeah, I think also it would be just, from my understanding of how a curator functions, um, you're taking an artist's fantastical vision and you, you want it to make it make it happen you want it to be possible but you're also facing like very you know real world you know parameters logistics and I mean I'm curious to know for you what is the process that by which you kind of bounce back and forth between these two poles like maintaining the integrity of the piece but then also dealing with all of the other you know things that you actually need to make it possible make it happen and I think also especially in the context of like a 
a, a, an artwork that is so socially uh, engaged? Like, how do you, how, how did that work for you? Well, I mean, I think that in curating, and Zurich will know this too, curators are as distinct as artists are in that they, everyone has their own kind of approach, really, and very distinct ways of doing things. And um, I come at things as much as possible with a real kind of compassion to, want to understand where something's coming from, so kind of lots of conversation. And knowing you have to get to the end point of something for the public. So say with working with Sonia or with other artists, the artist is in the mode of exploring what is of interest to them and in exploring their place in the world. And so of course, I want to nurture that and hold that space. But I'm also thinking of the 14-year-old who might get really switched on by a ton of ideas who just happens to come along. And so trying to think always about the end point of people encountering the work for the first time um, and how those ideas come through. So I'm always, my, I'm always living in the future with something, um, chatting with another curator who does a lot of commissions we were talking about it the other day. You kind of, as a curator, half your head in the future end point of people visiting, even at the very first conversation, not to direct or dictate, but to kind of hold that space. And I will often do a bit of geeking out as well on their... Um, looking at afresh at the past works that artists have done so that to, to find a thread through like the heart of the concepts within their work, um, which I included, for example, in that book when I was looking at Sonia's work, going right back to the 80s, to kind of find what's a thread through, partly so I can kind of hold that, if that makes sense, so that there's that consistency there and everything else can play around. And then constraints to me are just, they're just part of life. They're part of the creative process, including the money, of which there is never enough money, there's never enough time, there's never enough people. We know that. So it's just part of the creative constraint. So to be open about that from the beginning, so that when you're making decisions, I think being really transparent and talking about that, I find I do that. Because then you're making trade-off decisions together as to what you're investing in in the project and what you're not investing in, rather than saying, yeah, yeah, as much money as you like in this, and again, actually, there isn't. But it could be a crucial point of a really brilliant idea. So that, yeah, back and forth continually, to shape, to shape, to shape, um, is the approach that I take, and everyone else will have different approaches, I'd say. Thank you so much, Emma. A big round of applause for Emma Ridgway. <laughs> And it's now our immense pleasure to introduce Precious Okoyomon. Um, uh, Precious is a poet and artist based in New York City and, and Al. And uh, Precious has had uh, many, many museum shows, institutional shows, most recently at Luma Vespa in Zurich, at the MMK in Frankfurt, a performance space in New York City, um, the Park Night, uh, major performance commission at the Serpentine, curated by Claude Argile, who is also here with us uh, today, also at the ICA. Um, there have been poetry books. Uh, the first poetry book is actually right now exhibited in Dominic Gonzalez Förster's uh, exhibition. It's totally out of print, but Dominic remade it in a bigger scale. The second book, but Did You Die, we, we co-published actually by Wonder Press and the Serpentine in 21. And there is also a third book uh, on its way. And uh, Precious has been actually in residence in Arles in 20 and also in 21. It's the 21 recipient of the Freeze Art Fair Award. And of course, the artist who has done the extraordinary installation to see the earth before the end of the world here in the uh, Arsenale. And so we are welcoming here Precious uh, Okoyaman and uh, also very importantly, Gravity. A very warm welcome to Precious and to Gravity. <laughs> and Precious, I wanted to begin by actually asking you to tell us a little bit about the extraordinary work to see the Earth before the end of the world. And it's, it's much more than a, an installation. Um, it's, we need kind of new vocabulary or neologisms not to describe what it is. It's really world-making, uh, and it's fascinating how all of a sudden, in the context of an exhibition, a world appears, a portal into a world. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the genesis of this, of this piece? I wanted to make something that felt that I hadn't seen. I wanted to make a space that I felt didn't exist. 
So I made a portal of its own world made of sugar cane and kudzu, which I've had this ongoing relationship with for a while now. We're in a sort of entanglement of mystery with each other. <laughs> I, you know, I've been working for about like a year, slowly growing all of these things and um, just trying to figure out how this world could be. Um, my relationship with the sugar cane is like one that's long and has its own history. My like great grandmother used to grow it out like in her village, and then like it, I've always been obsessed with it when I was a child. And then it, like you know, it has its history of like for me coming to it from like a glissant, like with like reading Montia Toussaint. It's just like glissant got it you know it was like you can't escape the history of the object so getting to create this space of like these monstrous plants or plants with this bloody monstrous history and giving them a free space to go crazy in um, a dream <laughs> so I mean also the freedom of not knowing what's going to happen in that space in the next seven months it's its own miracle um, all I can do is sow the seeds and hope that the world takes over. <laughs> Maybe it would be great to hear a little bit more about this aspect also that it's uh, really a living organism. Because I think it's very interesting, this aspect that artworks more and more now, I mean, and it's both true for physical artwork and for digital artwork, I mean, it happens very strongly with um, game, with gaming also. I mean, Ian Shank talks about it with the simulations and the gaming digitally, that artworks are kind of living organisms. Uh, and, 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 and here, I mean, when I was there the first day on, on Tuesday, butterflies were just about to be born. And it's, of course, always going to change as studio piece in Frankfurt. Could you talk a little bit about this idea of um, to see the earth before the end of the world being a a living organism in permanent transformation. I'm, I feel like I'm always thinking in kind of this like agential materiality and this geological time kind of like outside of time space where it's like, yeah, there is no separation for me between this like non-living, like living human world. I believe that it's all blurred and kind of entangled. So getting the opportunity to work with like you know, actual living organisms and just creating the conditions for them to thrive, like that, like, because me, for, to me, the art isn't just like what's in the space, it's like how it lives and like breeds and entangles to the earth and like, and then I get to like, you know, whatever grows in there in those seven months, it's like, okay, after that, it's like, that's building soil. That soil goes back out to the community and like, it's not just art anymore. It like, you know, goes literally back into the earth and then like, you know, someone's gonna use that in their farm. You know, it's like that energy continues like building and going out. And then like, that's the always already every day, like poetics of relation for me. It's like how it spreads, how it changes and like grows. Yeah, I think in, in your installations, I, always feel very still and very calm. And in that stillness, I'm able to pay more attention to the non-living organisms that are in the space, the insects, the fungi. Um, and I think for me, I understand that you approach social practice not just with other humans, but it also extends to, to the non-human. And I would love to just hear you um, elaborate on that a bit and how you think about that in your practice. Mm, I mean, I'm always trying to think my way out of the human or the, the <laughs> um, or this kind of, you know, it's this like big like Copernicus idea of man that I feel like we're kind of still stuck in, which is like quite exhausting to me sometimes because you know, at, at least at this point we should be like, oh yes, the blur, everything is like radi radically entangled and you can't really separate it. And this individualism, like it's like not only like literally killing us every day, it's like you really can't separate it. It's quite impossible. So it's nice to be reminded to be like brought down to the grounding of like the earth and like, you know, it really is like truly, we really, I do want to see the earth before the end of the world or the world as the world, you know? Yeah, I think like this idea of thinking your way out of being human is funny. I feel like maybe instead of thinking one's way out, you feel your way out. It is feeling. Yeah, you sense your way out. <laughs> yeah, it's more coming back to like um, like a grounded like feel knowing. Yeah, that's what it is, the feel knowing. <laughs> and if you think about the idea of, 
an artwork <coughs> being about world building, it of course also brings us to maybe different uh, temporalities than, than exhibitions. And it's interesting, I mean, Roman Kajanic wrote this book about how to be a good ancestor and talks about this more about deep time, you know, and about longer durational kind of formats which go beyond, yeah, really totally beyond event culture, go, go into, um, uh, into formats which are more sustainable. And it's interesting, I think, right now that artists are more working on gardens and farms, maybe, than exhibitions. I mean, Otto Bong Nakanga in Kashonibari are both working on farms in um, Nigeria, and you have actually um, accepted an invitation uh, from the Aspen Museum, but turned it from an exhibition into, into a garden, and it's also a longer duration project. Can you tell us a little bit about this idea of maybe gardens rather than exhibitions? I, I you know, it's the space of portals, I say. It's like how I like getting out of the room and more into the world of like, you know, it maybe taking us out into like a space that we feel a bit uncomfortable of or a one that already approaches us every day but we don't know how to like really see so I really like this ability to kind of like also it's the play for me it comes back to that it's like this freedom of getting kind of like malleable and like loose and getting to like dream in a different way that doesn't feel like bound by anything um it's also just so fun. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really just like having fun. I really do just want to play outside. <laughs> I think um, about poetry a lot when I think about your practice. And I mean, for me personally, I think like poetry was not always the easiest thing for me to access until I kind of adjusted how I approach poetry. You don't read poetry to understand every single line in the stanza, but you kind of allow the impressions of the words to kind of flitter in and out of your mind. And you, I'm, I'm curious to know how you approach the, the poetry of others and also how you approach you know, poetry in your own practice. But in particular, like how you read the poetry of other, of others that you, of other poets that you love. Well, I always say that like most of my installations start out as poems because I, I'm a poet first. Um, they start as poems and the poems need to be like built into a space or like an environment or an object. Um, it always starts with the poem for me. I constantly am writing and even in little fragments, even it's like text, an iPhone note, like everything is constantly being like archived down as the memory database. And then sometimes that actually has to become in an environment. Um, and I mean, literally, this show that I did in the Arsenal is a response to an Ed Robertson poem. Um, it is literally, I like, how do you invoke the earth before the, to see to destroy the world? Honestly, to see it crumble. Um, so, it, poetry is my moving force. <laughs> it is my heart. Um, yeah, I and reading other poets is like what keeps me falling deeper and deeper in love with poetry. Um, it's constantly like, I'm always reading like 10 poetry books at once. <laughs> I'm like sponging them up. Um, so it's, I'm always like finding somebody new who I'm falling in love with. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's continuous. And I can't imagine being a poet without constantly reading other poets because I always say it's like a love language of like um, speaking in tongues. It's like literally like, archive memory of everyone else's collective dreaming. And I'm like, hmm, I just want to sponge it up. <laughs> yeah, you told me recently that it's urgent to read Alice Notley. Urgent. Start at benediction. So you should all, we should all read Alice Notley. Alice Notley. We love Alice Notley. Last question, Precious. Uh, I asked Sonia before. I wanted to ask you the unrealized project question. But I also wanted to ask that same question to Gravity. So it's a question for both of you. Um, a project which has been too big to be realized or too expensive or maybe too time intense or maybe um, utopic or maybe a dream or a project which has been censored or a project you haven't dared to do yet or maybe a forgotten project somewhere in a locker or in a file. What are your unbuilt roads? Mm, I have so many. The one that's been on my mind lately is this kind of dream library. I feel like there should be a dream archive somewhere 
because lately I've been asking, I've been obsessed with other people's dreams because I had this period where I didn't dream for like a month. I would, like my, I actually dreamt, but my dreams were like this dark space where I could only feel vibrations. So it was really intense for me. So in this place, I was like, what are other people like? Uh, so I would like ask everyone, like would text my mom in the morning and be like, what were your dreams? <laughs> so it's like actually really nice for me because it really... I really am so curious as to other people's like nighttime time travel. Um, I think it's important maybe for us to all be collectively sharing our dreams and it should just be in one place that we can go and also watch and listen to other people's dreams. This is my project right now, fantasy. I want a dream library. <laughs> Wait, so like what, like physically or like digitally, like what would physically, this? Physically, like it would be this space where you can, it's basically a temple of dreaming. You go, you record your dreams and someone literally files them away. It could be in any form that you need to take. Like you lay on a couch and you go and like you record your dream and someone's just there helping you like work through it and like actively remembering it. And then it would just be like stored and you could all, it would just be a constant place of like dreaming. So it's really beautiful because we have your wonderful dream library and we have the wonderful devotional museum of Sonia. So a devotional museum and a dream library. I think there couldn't be a more magical way maybe to end this conversation, no? Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much for your presence and your time today. It's been a pleasure to, to speak with you. And also thank you so much again to, to Mikolai. Uh, and the uh, Therme Dream Team. I think we should give them a very big round of thank applause. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Therme Team. We love you. And uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to Moni Lola. Thank you to Precious. Thank you to Emma. Thank you to Sonia. And thanks to all of you. Thank you to Gravity. Have a great day.